welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of James. Open your Bibles to James chapter 5, our text, um, if you read the bulletin, will comprise of verses 7 to 11. Stand with me if you're able and follow along at the reading of God's Word, James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold... Uh, It says, Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grumble not, uh, the word there uh, in verse 9 translated grudge means to to grumble or complain, if you will, or grudge. But the Scripture says there, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy who endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that we have this opportunity to study your word. We're thankful, Father, that you will give to us from your word that which is needed for us, not only collectively, but individually as well. And Father, as you do that, may we receive what you give to us with a heart of conviction to not only uh, apply this in our lives, but to share it with others as well. May it be a living testimony in our life that we receive from your word today, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. So I've titled the message today, Endure Joyfully in Longing for Christ's Return. Endure Joyfully in Longing for Christ's Return. Uh, A lot of believers today that are even, even believers are not very happy. They're not joyful because there's so much going on. Excuse me, as I mentioned early... Uh, in the announcements, that the times in which we're living are very, very difficult. Very difficult. If you have faith in Christ, uh, the very tenet, tenets and precepts of that which God has given to us are being challenged on a daily basis. Uh, last night, uh, they started setting fire to Atlanta, already having burned many other cities. Uh, you know, starting in Minneapolis and spreading around our United States. We're seeing violence like we've never seen it before. I know in my days, I have never seen people take over a large section of a city, like eight block area in Seattle, Washington, and nobody does anything about it. They just walk away from it. Absolutely insane. I believe that... I believe that a lot of this is politically motivated. Uh, It it clearly has that uh, connotation, clearly. When you look at contrasting news sources, we have news sources that say this is atrocious behavior uh, that we're experiencing in our country. Another station applauds it as, as protests that are peaceful. Uh, and just have a few uh, oddities here and there. I believe it all started when half of the people in America, thereabouts, said three over three years ago, he's not my president. 
You can't be a Christian and be obedient to the Lord and say, whoever it is, <clears throat> whether it's the previous president, the current president, or the next president, we cannot say with a heart of belief to God and obedience to him, that person is not my president. We understand from the book of Romans that we are, and that's not the only place, we're to be in a, under authority and be subject to the authority that is over us. And because all authority is in power, is the word used in the King James, but all authority is given by God. Now we understand, you look back through the, the history as we did here uh, on Wednesday nights for a long time when we studied the history of Israel, Judah and uh, the northern kingdom, we studied that history even it was divided. <clears throat> and the, uh, there were many times when the kings were just evil, evil as they could be. It's still an authority that God allowed. Now that doesn't mean that we have to compromise our faith in God. We never have to compromise our faith in God. And we should never do that to be obedient. Daniel certainly showed that when they commanded him, you know, he, you know, and not to pray to his God, and he prayed to his God anyway. And we ought to do that. We ought to stand up for God. We say stand up for Jesus. We sing that. But we don't... So I will say this, that all of those believers that, let me put it this way, all of those people who claim to be believers are clearly disobedient to God when they say, and maybe you're one of them, I don't know, and they say, that's not my president. And that has led a string of hatred that has been exhibited towards the leadership in our country for over three years. And I believe we're seeing the culmination of that as we get near the next election. I don't want to get political about this thing, but there are some realities in our society that cannot be ignored. And when, and when we have a place where people can just go into an area, here's what they've done, if you don't know, they've sectioned off an area, just some people. I've heard, I don't know, that it's Antifa and it's Black Lives Matter. That those are the, the groups that have gone in. That they've gone in and they've taken over this area. They have barricaded themselves into the area. And they have, of course they haven't posted many signs. They've written, handwritten everything. But it says, and I've seen it on the camera, that, you are, that when you enter that area, you are now leaving the United States of America. There's no respect for our leadership. There's no respect for the flag that's, that, that is a symbol of the freedom and honor and integrity of this country, which one has to begin to doubt if those, if those wicked elements ever get into leadership position. And they may. And they may. But nobody, here's what bothers me, nobody has gone in to do anything about that insurrection. And they have actually established in their own minds, and effectively has established a different country within our United States. Now, legally, they have not. But effectively, they have. And there are people who are cheering for them and people who are, are cheering against them. So where have we come? We're living in a time where, where, where it, it seems everybody's got to pick a side. Well, I've always said one of the greatest freedoms we have is the freedom of choice. Uh, and the greatest choice, of course, is to choose the Lord. <laughs> what is it Joshua said? As for me and my house, we're going to choose the Lord. So what are we going to do? We need to take a stand for God. We need to take a stand for God. Now, with all of this running rampant, and, and, and so now you don't know where it's coming next. Uh, I have never owned uh, a weapon, uh, a gun. I've never owned one. When I got drafted into the military and I went and joined, they gave me uh, an, an automatic rifle, an automatic assault rifle, and I had to learn how to fire that. And you know what? 
I was top of my class in firing a firearm. I was the best. I had the highest score in the 250 people in the battalion. I don't want to say that to brag on myself, but I, I, could, I learned how to shoot the gun. It was an automatic rifle. It would f fire out 20 rounds in less than three seconds. And you had to be accurate with this weapon. And they tested you, put you on fields and ranges and all this stuff. And then they sent me over to, of course, I didn't go to the Vietnam War. I went to Korea. When I got over there, they gave me an old M16. <laughs> so that was a very different rifle. And I had to qualify on that. I had to learn how to fire that gun. Again, I was at the top of my class on firing a gun. I knew how to do it. It's like playing a video game. You just get the sight up there, you get it in the right place, and you, you know what to do, and you do it. So I learned how to, to do that as well. But I've never owned a gun. <clears throat> and I will say, and I've never owned a gun, because I never felt a need to own a gun. Uh, but I, I'll say this. <clears throat> The Lord has been nudging. I believe it's the Lord's. I don't know. I haven't jumped and made any decisions. But here's one of the things <clears throat> that gets on my mind. And that is some of these people are going into cities and they're just, they're just run, rampaging through the city. And they're just creating havoc and violence. They're burning things up and tearing things down. And who knows that your neighborhood or my neighborhood might be next. I told Mary for the first time in my life, I'm actually thinking about get buying some assault rifles. I know how to use them. Buying some assault rifles and several thousand rounds of ammunition in case they come into my neighborhood. So what, you know, I, I'm thinking about it. But I haven't done anything dr drastic. But here's what I do know. When I start thinking about stuff like that, I begin to wonder... What is our world coming to? That's not really the answer. Guns aren't the answer. The Lord is the answer. And we need to turn to the Lord. This passage today is what I was looking for back when we came back for the first message. And the Lord impressed. This is really about having patience, maintaining our fullness of joy, even in the most difficult of times. And we are living not in the most difficult times on this earth. I know that. We've seen history where it's much worse than what it is today, where it was not safe to even live in an area of the country. There are still some areas of the country where it's that way. We still have protection in some areas. <clears throat> Richard, he had a headache, couldn't come this morning. <clears throat> he went to Brandenburg the other day. <clears throat> they had a big... Word had it that protesters were coming and they were going to tear down statue and who knows they might burn the city. I don't know. So he's got a friend that lives down there. Uh, he went down to, the, um, to that friend's son's birthday party and uh, not too long ago. And so he went down there for the protest. He said there were, there were about 500 people from the town, small town, I guess. I've never been there. About 500 people. And said so they all came and said every one of them had at least three guns. They had a long rifle in their hand. They had a gun on each hip. And they were waiting for them. And it never happened. There were some people that came through and looked mighty scared and they left. It never happened. I don't know what the answer today is except seek the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And guess what? Patience is king here. Look at this passage. Patience is mentioned by that word five times in these five verses. In the first verse, we see it twice. Be patient. At the end of verse 7, uh, near the end, it says, and have long patience. Look at the, verse 8. <clears throat> Be ye also patient. <clears throat> and if you look down at the end of verse 10, end of patience. And then if you look uh, at verse 11, it says, you have heard of the patience of Job. <clears throat> so five times we see that word patience. You see the word endure in verse 11. Behold, we count it them happy who endure. Endure is that persevering, enduring patience. So by way of reference, it's six times in these five verses. There's no doubt 
When you look at these verses, the key factor that God's trying to drive home to us is we've got to have patience. We've got to have patience. I remember years ago, we first got saved. Mary told me one day, she says, you know, I stopped praying for patience. She says, when you pray for patience, you're praying for trouble. Because tribulation works patience according to the scripture. If you want patience, you're inviting tribulation into your life. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to pray for patience. Because you know what? We need patience. We need it. We need patience. How many times have you sat there looking at the TV and seeing what's going on and all of you get angry and get upset and maybe start getting a little loud about it? Maybe you start doing some things like thinking maybe you're going to buy some guns, right? Get crazy. We don't have patience. We don't have patience. All too often, when we think we have patience, watch out because guess what? There's still room for improvement. There's still room for improvement. So let's take a look at it. The first point that I believe we find in the passage here that I've indicated in the bulletin is anticipate the coming of Christ with patience. I heard uh, Brother Jim, I'm not picking on him, I heard him talking about the coming of the Lord. The answer is not, Lord, come now. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. Because you know why? Why? We should not pray against the will of God. Every time we pray, it should be in accordance with the will of God. What has God told us? Because God's will is God's way. God has told us nobody knows when the Lord's coming to rapture the church. Nobody knows. And so we need to sit back and do what? Wait? Yeah, but with patience. We have to exercise patience. You know what? Wouldn't Wouldn't it be nice... If we sort of go outside of the scriptures and say, you know, we, we're guaranteed an inheritance in heaven where everything is perfect. Our bodies are perfect. Our environment is perfect. Justice prevails. We have a perfect environment in heaven. There's, it's going to be eternal bliss. Eternal bliss. Who wouldn't want to leave and go there now? Well, unbelievers don't want to do that because they don't believe in heaven and hell. And if they do, they haven't given themselves to the Lord in faith, or they wouldn't be unbelievers. So, uh, but, you know, Peter said that the the promises of God are not slow. means they're not slack. That's what it says, not slow. Don't think that God has promised something that he's hesitating to do. God had a plan before he founded the world on when Christ would come and rapture the church. And we should never pray to alter that. Never. And when we say, Lord, come now, right? We're asking the Lord, Lord, I really want it now. It's selfishness. Selfishness. Here's what I see it as. Selfishness in the place of patience. God's given us a life to live to enjoy. And we're in the midst of many trials. If you look back to the first chapter of this book we've been studying for some time, it says here, uh, we started this back in September of last year. It says in verse 2 of chapter 1, my brethren, that's all believers here, count it what? Count it all joy. This means maximum joy. Count it maximum joy. Say, I want the most fun and happiness I can get. No, we want the most joy. Joy comes from the Lord, not from our circumstances. Ah. Count it the maximum joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That means various trials. Count it the maximum joy when you fall into all of these trials in our life. And we're living in a time when the trials of are all around us and they're trying us. And what we need to do, as James went on to say in verse 3, excuse me, um, <clears throat> verse 3 yeah, of chapter 1, knowing this, that is knowing that it's maximum joy to welcome all of these difficult trials in our life, knowing that the trying or testing of our faith works patience, 
It works patience. Ah, there's a but in verse 4. But, let, the word let means to allow. It's a command. Let patience have her perfect work. What is her perfect work? To give us a right and a righteous response to God. Regardless of the circumstances we're in. Circumstances do not change the joy of a believer. They're not to. They're not to change our joy. Because our joy and our hope and our confidence and our trust, our eternity, everything rests through the blood of Christ that was shed for us. And through the God who saved us by His grace when we put our faith in Christ. We go back to our text In James chapter 5 and verse 7, be patient, therefore. Be patient. That's a command. Folks, be patient. I need to be patient. Be patient, therefore, brethren. How long are we to be patient, Lord? My patience has just about run out. Wow, look at this. Here's how long we're to be patient. Until or unto the coming of the Lord. That's how long we're to be patient. You know, Paul wrote that the Lord's coming soon. (laughs) 2,000 years later, soon is still on the horizon because he's coming soon. The problem is that we, we look at a day or a week or a month of being in a trial as, as unnecessary when our perspective is that We're not counting it all joy. We should welcome the trials in our life. They are are perfecting us. That means they are maturing us. We don't, we don't, we haven't, we haven't gotten much better at responding to circumstances because we're not allowing patience to have her perfect work in us. We haven't counted it as all joy. We're not falling in line with the word of God to receive the trials with maximum joy. It's an attitude of joy. With an attitude of joy. You know, Jesus wanted the cup of death to pass from him. But he said, nevertheless, there's something much more important. And that's the will of God, the Father. And so he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. We should look forward to God's will being done. And we don't know it except through His Word. And that doesn't mean that we get a crystal ball. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what this afternoon is going to bring. Any one of us could pass from this earth today. We understand that and go home to be with the Lord. But the coming of the Lord will be when when God determines it is. We're not going to hasten it. We're not going to move it. We can't change it at all. So let's stop praying against the Lord's will or stop hoping against the Lord's will. We need to anticipate with a longing the coming of Christ. But in the meantime, we need to take a look at our circumstances that prevail, not only our personal circumstances and our own circle, but we need to look at our national circumstances and all in between and even worldwide circumstances. And count it all joy we fall into these trials. It says here, At the middle of verse 7, it gives us an example of how we're to be patient. It says, behold. In other words, we need to be patient um, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold. So we need to take a look at an example that God has given to us. The husbandman is a farmer here. The farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Long patience is not just the word patience. It's really, uh, when you take a look at the word, it's long-tempered. It's long-tempered. We all have a temper, don't we? Well, I've been able to control my temper. We should, because the Holy Spirit who indwells us gives us the ability to control our temper, to control our tongue, to control the things that we say, the things that we do. He's a restraining factor on our life because he reminds us of what we should be doing and and which many times is in opposition to what we want to do or what we're actually doing. But so this this is long suffering or long tempered uh, approach, if you will. It's self restraint in the face of provocation. You know who I think about when I see this? Self restraint in the face of provocation. 
I think of that young kid who was facing God drumming in his face in Washington, D.C. when they were out there and the kid wasn't doing anything wrong and they were trying to incite him into something and spent a lot of time yelling, screaming, banging a drum in his face and he stood there and he smiled. I tell you what, it's a young kid and he had a lot of patience for a young kid. That's what I saw that day. I saw patience. Because you know what most of us had wanted to do? At a minimum, grab that drumstick out of that guy's hand, slap that drum out of our face, maybe even punch the guy in the face, rustling to the ground, or somehow kick him or stone him or something else. He just stood there with a grin on his face. Guess what he got criticized for? Young kid. He got criticized for being mean to the man. That's what he got criticized for. You see, that, that's... We, patience is being able to endure that in the face of provocation, restraining ourselves. That's what this word means, this long patience. It's a different word than the other words used for patience in this passage. It's only used a few times in the New Testament, but it's that long temper. We don't, don't, because see, we want to exercise our temper. We don't want to exercise patience. When things get to the boiling point, somehow we all seem to have this, this threshold that we imagine that is acceptable in our mind. That there's a point, you push me to a point, and you're going to get it back. You know what the Bible says? Take a look at Stephen, who was being stoned to death, one of the greatest examples. They were th literally throwing stones at him to kill him. And I can see him on the road there kneeling down and praying for those people and say, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Patience in the midst of the greatest of provocations against us. And we feel it personally. We, we see a place like Seattle where they've taken over an area. If you really <clears throat> cherish the freedoms that God has given us in this country, it's an affront to us. It's an affront to us. And we feel a need to want to do something about that. We need to have patience. You know, Stephen could have thought within his own mind, you know, if I start throwing some of these stones back, maybe I can make a difference here. No. He threw some prayers out. Amen. Prayers. He used prayer. It was a clear sign of patience. We know that Stephen, as is given to us in the sixth chapter of Acts, that he was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And his power they couldn't resist. Oh yeah, they stoned his body, but they couldn't resist his power. That's why they were stoning him to death. So we need to be like the farmer who waits for that needed rain, not only early in the planting season, but even late in order to receive the crop. What does the farmer do? <clears throat> Does he go out and start trying to manufacture a rain machine? Yeah, people have even tried to do that, right? No, the farmer talked about here has done his job. Puts his hope in the Lord. The Lord will bring the needed rain. And then the crop will come. You put your trust. You put your hope. You put your faith in the Lord. It will bring it to pass. We don't. We don't manufacture our own circumstances. We deal with the circumstances we're in. Many times you look at circumstances and we want to point a finger and blame somebody for it. You know what? Probably 99 times out of 100, that's not the person responsible for our problem. But that's who we think it is because we want a scapegoat. We want a scapegoat. We want somebody to point a finger at. How many times we get in a mess and we look to ourselves, you know what, I'm the fault here. I'm the one. Now, you know, the natural mind doesn't accept that. <clears throat> it could never be my fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Always somebody else's fault. <clears throat> you know, I, <clears throat> things aren't working out right. It's the president's fault. He's the one. He created all this havoc. It's their fault. It's somebody else's fault. We need to exercise patience instead of complaining. We'll get to that. In verse 8, it says, be ye also patient. Be patient like the farmer. Be patient like the farmer. It says, a strengthen your hearts. Strengthen. The word established means strengthen. Strengthen your hearts, 
For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The day of the Lord is coming. In verse 7, it says the coming of the Lord. In verse 8, it talks about that coming is drawing nigh. Guess what? 2,000 years ago, the coming of the Lord is close. Amen. Amen? It's the same thing today. It's close. And so our expectation, and so there are people who say, you know, I don't know the Lord's ever going to come. The Lord is coming. It's a guarantee. It's a certainty about the Lord's coming that we must accept. And our patience is to endure until then. And so our hearts need to be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit within us to endure the times that we're in and the troubles that we go through and the circumstances that would move us to a thought that says, I just want to get out of here. Lord, take me home. Lord, I want to go. Come and rapture the church. None of those are acceptable with the Lord. It's always in the Lord's timing. Now, not only here uh, do we should we anticipate the coming of Christ with patience, but we must avoid complaining and consider the consequences. The word uh, that I mentioned in the reading uh, of verse 9 earlier, the word grudge literally means to murmur or complain. And so naturally, when we're struggling with patience and that persevering endurance, the thing we usually resort to is complaining. <laughs> Man, I don't know what, why me? I don't know why all these things are happening to me. We just, and, and I could pick a million examples. We all could do that. We all understand that we get in situations and we want to start complaining. It is natural to us to complain. God hates complaining. In the midst of knowing we're in these various trials, understanding that we're to exercise patience, count it all joy that we have the trials, we still resort to complaining, don't we? And this says, complain not one against another, brethren, uh, lest ye be uh, condemned. That means judged. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us that, um, that we're, those who are obedient to God are going to be rewarded. There's a reward. There's a reward. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 tells us part of what that reward will be. And that is an opportunity to praise God. Sometimes we, we think of rewards like, ah, oh, what are we going to get now? You know, We think of rewards on this earth and somebody offers a card and says, you're going to get rewards on this card. The first thing you want to do is look and say, what are they? I want to know what they are. What are the rewards? We're looking for material things. The reward may be more or greater opportunity or special opportunities to praise the Lord. Uh, we know that there are going to be rewards. If you look at, at Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12, because we're talking here about the coming of the Lord and having patience to the coming of the Lord, in Revelation 22 and verse 12, Christ is quoted by the Apostle John uh, in this uh, book, and the and, and Lord says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Those are works of righteousness. And in 1 Corinthians 3 and, 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 and other places, it tells us that those, those things, our works that are hay, stubble, and stone, are worthless, and they burn up in the fire. God's going to judge us by fire. Fire is that which takes away all of those things that are worthless and only leaves the valuable things. So our reward is going to be those valuable works of service that we've done to the Lord. It's not specified exactly what those rewards are in these passages. What we do know is when God, and here's where we have to put our trust in God and have faith in God. Faith is the things that are not seen. Faith that the rewards are real and they are valuable or God wouldn't have told us about them. And so God has told us that our works done in righteousness will bring rewards. If that's not enough knowledge for us, something's wrong. Because we want to know what is it that we can get that's different than what somebody else is going to get. And then we sort of want to work harder for that. The Lord says, trust me. 
There's going to be rewards. And Christ is going to bring rewards with him when he comes. Amen? Now, so avoid complaining. Complaining is one of the major things God addresses throughout the scripture. Children of Israel went 40 years in the wilderness because they complained against God. Because God said, here's the promised land. I'm going to give it to you flowing with milk and honey. And the spies went in and said, uh-uh, we ain't going to be able to go in there. It's too rough. There's too, those people are big and they're strong and they're fully armed. Who are we to go against them? But there were two spies, Caleb and Joshua said, hey, no problem, Lord. Uh, but the Lord is going to give us the land. It was a promise. They understood that it didn't matter what it looked like. There was a reality of truth in the word. That had been spoken to them and as we have to read today. So we know the Lord's coming. It is certain. It's a promise. And we know that God is requiring us to do righteous things. And guess what is not a righteous thing? Complaining. And sometimes we complain and we don't even realize we're complaining until sometime later. But the Holy Spirit will bring that to our mind. Let me ask the question. Do we ever confess the sin of complaining? It's not something that you need to answer out loud. But we, we must answer that to the Lord with a candid look at our own life. Say, well, I shouldn't have complained about that. Did we confess that sin to the Lord? First John says we need to confess those sins. We confess the sins to the Lord. We acknowledge that it's wrong. <clears throat> we go to the Lord and we confess that sin and say, Lord, that was a sin against you that I've committed, like David did in Psalm 51. Against thee and thee only have I sinned, Lord. I've complained again. <clears throat> and the, of course, when we take the same to profess, to confess that sin, means we take the same attitude towards that sin that God does. What's God's attitude? Don't do it again. <laughs> right? So we can't just do it and then ask for, and they say, well, you know, just ask for forgiveness later. <clears throat> uh, and that's not the way that God expects. Paul wrote about it in Romans as God forbid that we would ever think that the grace of God would be sufficient, that we can sin all we want. God's grace is fully sufficient, but not to give us freedom to sin whenever and as many times as we want. Thirdly, we need to accept the certainty of conflict and affliction. It's certain. It's been in the past. It will be always be in the future until the Lord comes and takes us home. In verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets, another example here, who have spoken in the name of the Lord. And we're talking about those who have, were spokesmen for God. It says, for an example, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Take the prophets. You can take a look at, at, at Jeremiah as he preached and prophesied against the, the southern kingdom and at the end against Jerusalem itself because of their sin, trying to get them to turn from their sin. Nobody would listen to him because his message was one of doom and gloom. What he said is the Babylonians are going to come in and they're going to take you captive. This was in the shadow of them already taking the northern kingdom ca captive. The Assyrians, and so now he says, the same thing's going to happen to you. Turn from your sin. And they laughed him off. Why? Because he painted a picture of doom and gloom. Many times, reality is doom and gloom. The Bible's full of doom and gloom for those who are disobedient and for those who reject the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is doom and gloom. To think that somebody's going to suffer an eternity in a lake of fire, never an opportunity to get even a momentary uh, time of relief, that's doom and gloom. As bad as it gets right there. But yet people don't want to talk about that. That's why when they get to the funeral home for their loved ones and, and friends, they all go to heaven. All my friends and all my family go to heaven. People that go to hell must be people from other families. People that have other friends. Think about it. Have you ever lost a family member who you don't believe is in heaven? It's worth thinking about. It's worth considering. The problem is that we're not, we're not willing to suffer affliction. And 
we're not willing for our family to suffer affliction and for a family member to go to the lake of fire would be eternal affliction. We don't even want them to suffer. When, a, when anybody in our family gets sick, maybe get terminally ill, we want God to heal them. If God answered all of our prayers, nobody would ever die. Think about that. Is that God's will? No, people are going to die. They've been dying since Adam and Eve, and they're going to keep dying. But there's a place where there is no death, and it's in heaven. But on this earth, there's going to be affliction. But he says here, more to the point, take the prophets who have spoken to you in the name of the Lord. They are an example for suffering affliction and of patience. Jer uh, Jeremiah was one of those. What we also find is Job is mentioned in verse 11. Behold, we count them happy who endure, not just the prophets, but those who who are like the prophets by way of patient enduring in the midst of very difficult and extreme circumstances. It says in verse 11, Behold, count them happy who endure. The same happiness that comes from chapter 1 and verse 2, the maximum joy. Count them happy because they have maximum joy. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Wow, there's reason for maximum joy. Remember what Job's wife said to him? Curse, just curse God and die. It's not worth living anymore. Job, said, Job says, my Redeemer liveth. My Redeemer liveth. I'm not giving my life up. God might take it. Might allow it to be taken. God didn't allow it. He didn't allow Satan to go that far. <clears throat> but I tell you what, if you look through the book of Job and you capture through the entire book of Job all of the things that he suffered, it's excruciating pain, excruciating circumstances. And say, well, there's always somebody worse off. That's Job. That's Job. Just He's the, the buck stops here. Job's the guy. Just take a look at his life and what he suffered. And when you take a look at his life, and he said, my Redeemer lives, guess what happened at the end of the book? God restored twofold. He multiplied what Job had. Job exercised patience. When he had three supposed friends that came and accused him of sinning to the highest degree in the name of righteousness or under the guise of righteousness, Job just kept plowing forward with patience. Patience, patience, patience. Just take a look at the prophets. They were always, always under the scrutiny of the world, even of the people of Israel, and look what they suffered. But the key at the end of this is there's a, there's a reason for our patience. Not only because God told us to be patient, but it says the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. I just want to close with Lamentations of Jeremiah chapter 3. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this uh, under the conviction of the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 3, and in verse 22, the Scripture says, It is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. The reason we'll steer, we're steer here is because of the mercy of God. There's none good. No, not one. Nobody's righteous. We don't deserve anything. We have, we have never and never will deserve anything that God has given to us or blessed us with. Never have we deserved any of that. When we understand that God is so gracious... And he is full of mercy. The reason we have not been consumed because God's compassions never fail. Verse 23, his compassions are new every morning. Great is the faithfulness of God. Great is the faithfulness of God. God has promised that Christ is going to come and rapture the church. It's a certainty. God is faithful. And all along the way, God's going to be merciful to us. And we're complaining about our circumstances. As we're complaining, God is exercising mercy in the midst of all that complaining. And we don't even appreciate it. Because we're mad. 
Because we got a little temper. We want things to run differently than the way they are. Verse 24 here says, The Lord is my portion, uh, saith my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. Patience means that patient hope. The Lord is good unto those who wait for Him. That's patience. To the soul that seeketh Him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. That's the deliverance of the Lord. God will deliver us from this earth. He's going to deliver us from this earth. It's certain. It'll be in His timing and not ours. Look down to verse 31 there. For the Lord will not cast off forever. It seems like... You know, we've seen the, the prophets write, Lord, why have you cast me off? Right? Verse 32, but though he caused grief. Look at that. Who caused grief? Mm. <clears throat> Check your Bible there. He refers back to the Lord in verse 31. But though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies those of the multitude are those that never fail and they're abundant and fresh and new every morning. And then if you take one more look down to verse 40, it says, let us search. This is where we come in. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. How have we been living? Not just regarding the circumstances that are prevailing that have come up in the recent last two, two weeks, Three months, three years, six years, 30 years. We need to try ourselves. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and said, examine yourselves whether or not you're in the faith. We need to examine ourselves and particularly as we come across areas in our life that, are, that represent disobedient, a disobedient walk to the Lord, we need to search our lives. We can't leave here today and smell, eh, you know, complaining, you know, murmuring. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just forget about that. Let's go on and have some fun. Get home and complain about something else. Not the way to do it. We've got to search our ways when here's the way. I mean, what good is Bible study if we don't apply it? We take the Word of God as we receive from the Word of God today from James chapter 5, a couple other passages, and we take that and we use that to examine our lives to see whether or not we are patiently enduring the multitude of trials in our life, counting them as maximum joy as we anticipate the coming of the Lord that will come when He comes. We don't know when it is, but we're happy He's coming. We may not live to see it. We may live to see it. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. We're still going to experience the coming of the Lord. And we've been saved by the grace of God. And those who precede in death, believers who are alive at that time, they will come out of the graves first. And there'll be, I think, a gigantic roaring hallelujah from all the saints. Amen to be in a very, I mean, their soul's already in the presence of the Lord, but now the body's going to be joined with the soul, and God's going to take us to heaven to forever be with Him. Let's never lose sight of that. The context of, of having patience and, and not complaining uh, and having this patient hope and expectation is, is all in the context of the coming of the Lord. The Lord's coming. We have a deliverance the world doesn't have. They don't have that. People are creating havoc in our world are disobedient and, and God-haters and unbelievers. They're going to get their just reward. It's going to be condemnation in an eternal pit called the lake of fire. We call it hell as well. That's where they're going to live forever. We're not going to exercise that judgment. God does that. What we need to do while we're on earth is be missionaries for the Lord and give witness and testimony to others about how good the Lord is. Warning them of how powerful He is and what their consequences could be. That's where we need to be, fully aligned with the Word. So let's do as Jeremiah wrote in his lamentation. Uh, and let's examine ourselves, try ourselves, and see whether or not we're actually living our lives and behaving and acting and speaking and thinking in accordance and in conformance with the Word of God. Let's stand together for you.
Father, Your love is perfect. You love us. We're Your children. And that love is perfect. And Father, there's no reason to complain. You bless us abundantly. You require things of us. May we be careful to examine our own lives to see if we're fulfilling Your expectations. That whatsoever things we do in word or deed or thought, that they're pleasing in Your sight. Father, we just thank You for the passage You've given us today, for the focus of, upon our own selves, whether or not we're truly exercising patience in our lifetime. Father, it's so critical. We know patience is, runs the gamut through the Scriptures, and it's a key ingredient of every believer's life. <clears throat> and if we're complaining, <clears throat> we're not patient. <clears throat> That's the context that we have. If we're complaining, we're not satisfied. We're not experiencing maximum joy. And Father, we understand that sufficient in and of itself to give us maximum joy is the love that you've given to us through your great salvation. And we thank you for your mercies, which fail not, fresh and new every day. Father, for your faithfulness, knowing that the promises of Scripture are a certainty. And with all of this, Father, we give you praise and thanks, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.